CEL Communications and Entertainment Limited. There have been many events and celebrations in Australia's bicentennial year, but few of them can equal this celebration of the air. 350 aircraft have gathered from all over the world. The static displays are vast with 270 aviation exhibitors and over 12,000 square meters of pavilions. It's the biggest air show ever held in the Southern Hemisphere. It's nine o'clock in the morning and already the crowds are flocking into the Richmond Air Force Base just north of Sydney. And appropriately, waiting to greet them and start the show is the majestic sight of a massed balloon ascent. In every colour imaginable, these vast pioneers of man flight make a spectacular curtain raiser for the Australian Bicentennial Air Show. Twenty of them have ascended over the airfield and await the whim of the wind to decide their destination. For the Royal Australian Air Force, this is, without a doubt, the major event, maybe major aviation event of our bicentennial year. Certainly it'll have tremendous spin-offs for us as far as recruiting is concerned, but it's anything but a mere recruiting exercise. This is, uh, to put it uh, in the, one single phrase, a celebration of Australian aviation. The Royal Australian Air Force has been a major part of our aviation history and we're here to celebrate that. Nothing like this has ever been attempted before in Australia. Nothing like this has ever been attempted before in the Southern Hemisphere. Look around you uh, what we have uh, here at Richmond and I think you will see that we have never done anything like this before and I doubt short of a uh, hundred years from now we're likely to do it again. of the Bicentennial Air Show is yesterday, today and tomorrow. And there are quite a few old warbirds here to remind us that they were top guns even in the First World War. The Airship 600 is being buzzed by a Bristol F2B fighter, which saw service over the trenches in 1917. Powered by a Rolls-Royce Falcon engine, it carried a pilot and a rear gunner and a dozen 20-pound bombs. The Fokker triplane was its adversary in many dogfights. The most famous fighter of World War I, it numbered many distinguished men amongst its pilots. Hermann Goering even made his reputation as an ace flying a Fokker triplane, as did Baron von Richthofen. Flying in friendly formation is the Sopwith Pup. Over 1900 of these successful fighter planes were built and it entered service in 1916. The Sopwith Pup has a maximum speed of 179 kilometers per hour, a length of just under six meters and a wingspan of nearly nine meters.
This biplane has much smaller dimensions, but is built just as faithfully to the original. Model aeroplanes are here in all shapes and sizes, from tiny helicopters, to fighter planes that do everything but strafe the runway, massive, in modeling terms, one-fifth scale replica of a B-25J Mitchell bomber with a four-meter wingspan. Each of these models represents hundreds of hours of work and are valued in the thousands of dollars. The aeroplane you see here is the Super Chipmunk. Modifications, including a modern engine and metal wings, now allow the aeroplane to be pulled out of maneuvers, such as a flat spin, that previously were impossible. Incidentally, the smoke you see coming from under the fuselage on this and many aircraft at the show is produced deliberately to make it easier to trace the aircraft's movements in the air. unusual looking aircraft is the Transavia PL-12 Sky Farmer and as the name suggests it's designed for agricultural work. The Sky Farmer is designed and developed by the Transavia Corporation in Sydney which began deliveries of production aircraft in December 1966. Since then more than 120 have been sold all over the world including China where one of its attractions must be its amazing handling capabilities. The intrepid gentlemen you see here are the Sky Dancers, the only civilian formation aerobatic team in Australia. Flying around the sky just three metres apart is a young man's occupation, you might think, but the three pilots have amassed 88 years of flying between them. The planes they are flying are all pit specials, probably the best known aerobatic aircraft in the Western world. These are two biplanes from de Havilland, the DH-84 Dragon, which was introduced as a light commercial airliner, and the DH-87 Hornet Moth, a two-seater touring biplane built in 1937. On a cold morning in May 1928, four men began what has been called the greatest flight ever made. The airframe was Dutch from the famous Fokker company, and the three engines were mighty right whirlwinds. The aircraft was the Southern Cross, piloted by Charles Ulm and Charles Kingsford Smith. The flight was from San Francisco to Brisbane, which they completed in just over 83 hours flying time.
just as historic as the Southern Cross, but a generation younger, is the Douglas DC-3, or C-47 Dakota, as its military version is known. From 1935, thousands were built for civil and military use and gained a reputation for low maintenance, reliability, flying ease, comfort and virtual indestructibility. This DC-3 was bought by Australian National Airlines in 1938. It was used as a domestic passenger aircraft between Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. Uh, it's had a fairly interesting career, been involved in three major accidents, uh, been repaired uh, three times, went out of service in about uh, 1973, it's done 67,000 hours, which is the equivalent of about three trips to the moon or something. In uh, one of the accidents, the uh, left-hand engine caught fire and the pilots uh, descended and made an emergency landing at Yass, which uh, resulted in the aeroplane being badly damaged with a collision with trees. The left-hand wing was uh, removed. Um, it was dismantled, uh, road transported to Sydney, where uh, repairs were effected and the aeroplane was put back into service again. Just to show that it does keep up with the times, ANSET have brought examples of their modern jet fleet to the show. The British Aerospace 146 you see taking off is a short haul airliner and is used extensively in Europe, where its comparative quietness allows it to be operated out of city airports 24 hours a day. Aerospace also have two new planes at the airship. The Hawk 100, a two-seater advanced trainer, and the Hawk 200, a single-seat multi-role fighter. The Hawk is in service with a number of air arms and has flown almost 500,000 hours. As you might expect, the Americans have brought their big guns to the show. I've been flying aircraft since 1972, and uh, being young and energetic and uh, uh, sometimes a little reckless, uh, there's some things that you do as a younger pilot that you don't do now, as, uh, now that I've been doing it for a while. I'm much more conservative than I was before, based on my experiences. Uh, I think I'm a better pilot uh, because of that conservative approach. I think I'm much safer now than I was before. Uh, so from that regard, I think uh, it's good. But there are some times, because we fly aggressively and very dynamically, that a, that a recklessness is an attribute. It's a, it's a positive characteristic. Uh, and that's the things that the young people have that, that I may be losing in my older years. Many experts consider the F-15 Eagle the best fighter in the world. Designed for air-to-air -air combat, it performs in a number of other roles and can deliver a staggering seven tons of offensive weapons. The F-15 is designed to outfight any current or projected enemy aircraft. The two Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines can develop a maximum speed for the aircraft of 2,660 kilometers per hour. The new version can operate at weights up to 38,000 kilos, twice as much as the famous B-17 Flying Fortress. The F-15's amazing performance is achieved through a high thrust to weight ratio and low wing loading. The F-15 holds the world record for a time to height performance, 65,616 feet in two minutes and three seconds.
from the most powerful of airplanes to those that have none at all, or at least only a little. Some people can't resist putting an engine on anything, even a hang glider. It used to be that the easiest and most economical way to fly was to pilot a glider, but now there are ultralights. Well, in the early days there wasn't any compulsory requirement for training. There is now, and in the early days the machines really were developmental ultralights. Today we have uh, manufactured ultralights produced by professional firms and we have the support of the uh, Ultralight Federation with pilot training and those two factors combined really do make ultralights one of the safest type of ultralights or aircraft you can get involved with. It's a marvellous experience, it really is total freedom. I'm sitting in a, an open cockpit, I can see everything, uh, you can really enjoy your flying and you're not paying a fortune for it. It's really the only way to fly, total freedom. The de Havilland Caribou is a twin-engine all-weather utility transport. The first Caribou flew in 1958, and since then has been sold to air forces all over the world. It will carry 32 troops or 28 paratroopers, and in its ambulance role up to 22 stretcher patients. Despite its ungainly and clumsy appearance, the Caribou is highly manoeuvrable and designed to land on unpaved runways. call it the pig, but the General Dynamics F-111 was the first aircraft to prove that variable geometry, the swing wings, can make a formidable aircraft. Its range of 3,747 kilometers make it one of the few aircraft able to fly long distances at low altitude. Although it was originally designed as a fighter, the F-111 is in fact a bomber, carrying up to 12,000 kilos of conventional bombs. The Raven version of the F-111 is equipped as an electronic countermeasures craft, a jamming platform used to clear the way through defences for attack aircraft.
One of the outstanding features of the Bicentennial Air Show is the Qantas Pavilion. It's a landmark which can be seen from all over the airfield. Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Services is Australia's oldest airline and the second oldest in the world. Despite humble beginnings as an aerial taxi service, Qantas now operates a large fleet of jumbos and flies to 42 cities in 24 countries. The static displays of World War II aircraft draw thousands of visitors. And all the legends are here. The Messerschmitt 109, The Supermarine Spitfire, of which 655 saw service with the RAAF. The North American Aviation Mustang, that still looks impressive in flight. It was even more impressive in the closing years of the war, with heavier armament, three times the fuel capacity and greater speed than a Spitfire. The display of great fighting planes is almost endless. This is the Sea Fury. The North American AT-6 Harvard infamous and invincible Mitsubishi Zero that was first encountered by Western forces over Pearl Harbor. This aircraft was found uh, on Gaspard airstrip on New Britain. Uh, it had been uh, damaged by Allied aircraft strafing strip. Uh, once the aircraft was US, the, the Japanese couldn't use it and it was abandoned. Uh, the aircraft sat at Gaspard there until the late 60s where it was first discovered and about 76 it was withdrawn um, with permission from the PMG government back to Australia for uh, restoration to the Australian War Memorial. Anybody familiar with early jets will recognise this aircraft the de Havilland Vampire that served as a jet trainer with the Royal Australian Air Force. This Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation Sabre really does have teeth. Two 30mm Aden cannons plus a complement of rockets. When it met its opposite number, the MiG-15 over the skies of Korea, the opposing pilots seemed unwilling to enter combat and became a source of constant frustration for US pilots.
If you wanted to airlift four Mercedes buses or a couple of 30-meter yachts, this would be the plane to use, the Antonov 124. The cargo hold is so large, the Wright brothers could have taken their first flight entirely inside it. The Antonov 124 holds the world record for an airlift, 171,000 kilos. And it's able to operate on unpaved runways. So if you wanted to erect an airport in a remote area, you could fly the buildings in and the construction crew all in one hop. Our Ruslan is uh, the biggest plane in the world now. And uh, this size uh, is uh, 73 meters uh, wingspan and uh, 70 meters length and uh, high 21 meters. Uh, the eyes of the pilot uh, are located on the uh, 12 meters on the ground. Oh, my experience is uh, uh, 14,000 uh, flight hours uh, and uh, more than 30 years. That's my profession. The highlight of any air show are the aerobatic displays. This is the Russian champion, flying a plane especially designed for aerobatics. The Sukhoi Su-26M is of all metal construction and stressed to high limits. It has to be. During some of the maneuvers, the pilot is pulling 13 Gs. The engine is a 360 horsepower M14P nine-cylinder radial engine producing a maximum speed of 350 kilometers per hour and a maximum rate of climb of 1,080 meters per minute. This is some of the most superb aerobatic flying you're ever likely to see.
Flight Lieutenant Scott Goodyear is one of the legendary few. A frontline fighter pilot with the RAAF who has now become a test pilot. Sadly, the Dassault Mirage he is flying is due to be phased out of service and replaced by the FA-18 Hornet. But even after 24 years of RAAF service, the Mirage is still an impressive aircraft and a great plane to fly. I've got to ask you, any similarity between the movie and Top Gun and what you do with this aircraft? Uh, a lot of people ask that. In fact, um, the flying sequences in the movie are, are fairly close to life. Uh, the workload in the cockpit and the both pilots being fairly frantic is basically what will happen in air combat. I've got to admit the tactics in the actual movie are more for camera than actually what would really happen. But um, for a person who's real, never really experienced it, it's uh, fairly true to life. How did you become a fighter pilot? Um, well, first of all, well, basically I started with the love of flying. Um, try, applied to join the Air Force, basically to fly, did a 12 month pilot's course, lucky enough to get sent to a fighter squadron for three years. Um, and then I chose to go, chose to be, oh, take a first graduate course and become a test pilot. And that's what I am flying as now, a test pilot. And you can see that the orange white colours are not really operational type colours, but for test flying they're sort of very, very visible. Um, so that's why we painted up that, uh, that colour, to make it highly visible for trial tasks. How stressful it is it flying aircraft like this? Is it a stress game? It is stressful, like uh, most of my, my sorties may only range between 0.8 to 1 hour, but in that 1 hour I'm working very hard the whole time on, on most of the sorties I fly, and I'll, I'll come back run out basically. What's it like up there when you're doing all those aerobatics? Oh, oh, it's great, I love it, I really do. I take it you don't have a big meal before you go up? Uh, in fact, it's funny to mention, you've got to eat something, otherwise I find that it's uh, far more difficult to fly, but no, I don't have a big meal, no. <laughs> Making their international debut at the show is Kiwi Red, the aerobatic team of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Unlike many national aerobatic display teams, Kiwi Red is comprised of six operational pilots from New Zealand's frontline unit number 75 squadron. They fly Skyhawk fighter bombers and are led by Wing Commander Frank Sharp, who you can hear issuing instructions to the pilots on his team.
got there. The maneuver you'll soon see is a world first. A barrel roll with one aircraft plugged into the air-to-air -air refueling system of his leader. Plugging into the system while flying in close formation is a tricky business. Strike on, guys. And strike off, guys. Behind the aerobatics and technology, the Bicentennial Air Show, like any other, is open for business. Well, we have brought here a range of all our products, both civil, military aircraft, guided weapons, and a whole range of systems and equipment. Finally, our space areas. Uh, in China, the labor is cheaper. Uh, Transatlantic vehicles are cheap, and we do not uh, seek for high profit uh, excessive profit.
range of products you see, including uh, helicopter engines, uh, train engines for trainers, as well as the, the engine you can see here, which is a working engine. It was flying two weeks ago, and it'll be flying in two weeks' time. Um, the 54,000 pound thrust RB211. Well, we're a prime contractor on Space Station. Today, we supply the, the power assist module, which uh, lifts the satellites out of our space shuttle and into a higher orbit. We have uh, good technology, top of the line technology, and we're looking to develop that technology in conjunction with Australian industry. Just the thing for a quick shopping trip is this rotorcraft. It would probably surprise you to know that the first manned flight of a helicopter took place in 1907, just four years after the Wright brothers first talked to the air. And if you're wondering what keeps this machine in the air, the answer is downdraft, the principle that keeps all helicopters aloft. More conventional are these Bell Kiowa helicopters. Over 7,000 of them are in service. This is the French Squirrel, manufactured by Aerospatiale. More than 1,000 have been delivered and it's in service with the Australian Air Force and Navy. These are three civil helicopters, the Squirrel Rescue, Robinson R-22 and the Italian Augusta A-109.
The Russian Kamov Ka-32 is one of the latest helicopter designs. In its military form, it is used for anti-submarine warfare and utility transport. The twin rotors give enormous lifting power. These Bell Iroquois helicopters are used by armies all over the world for transport and the insertion of troops into rugged or jungle terrain. They saw extensive service in Vietnam. The Westland Sea King is used by navies for anti-submarine warfare and search and rescue. These two are based at Nara and normally carry anti-submarine torpedoes and depth charges. The Chinook is the heavyweight of the division. Able to carry a payload of several tons, it can insert a number of troops and their equipment into the field. One of the most maneuverable helicopters is the Sikorsky 570A Black Hawk. Just watch the pilot throw it around the sky.
visitor to the show is a United States Boeing B-52 Stratofortress. This massive plane is deployed as the strike aircraft for the US Strategic Air Force. It's a sobering thought that just one of these can deliver more destructive power than all the weaponry used in the Second World War. This B-52 has just flown in from Guam, a 25-hour round trip, and after a few passes over the runway, leaves again without even landing. This Hercules C-130 is loaded, as it often is, with parachutists. The Hercules is the most successful military transport in recent years, with over 2,000 having been delivered. The RAAF operates 24 of them. Inside the fuselage are parachute teams from the Australian Army, the Royal Air Force, the Canadian Forces and the Royal New Zealand Air Force. The Australian Red Berets, named after their distinctive headwear, are all instructors at the Nara Parachute Training School. The Royal Air Force team is the Falcons, the UK's leading parachute display team. And what a spectacular display they make.
still a crowd stopper even after 20 years of service is the British Aerospace Sea Harrier. Despite its designation as a warplane, the world's air forces saw it only as an amusing curiosity. But in 1982, the Harrier startled the world with its deadly performance in the Falklands. It wasn't only its ability to take off vertically from carrier decks, it was its amazing maneuverability in the air. In air-to-air -air combat with Skyhawks and Mirages, it proved its superiority time and time again. The thrust works through nozzles that rotate to provide either vertical or horizontal thrust. The Harrier is the only aircraft built, apart from the helicopter, that doesn't require an airfield. A degree of forward thinking that doesn't seem to have impressed the major powers of the world yet. This is the Panavia Tornado F3, a two-seater air defense interceptor and the very latest concept in fighter design. Well, it's designed for operating over the uh, North Atlantic, uh, so it has very long range, very large weapon load to take out any threat to the UK. Um, taking out large formations of bombers, uh, an effective radar, long-range radar, and good weapon system. Uh, it's very fast. It's probably the fastest fighter around uh, these days, and uh, it's reasonably maneuverable, but not in the fighter sense, dogfighting sense of the word. It's a maneuverable interceptor. really is a misnomer in the F3 because uh, we have double IN so I do very little navigation the kit does it all it's all done uh, on a little tape and put in the computer it tells you where to go so really my job involves operating all the various bits of equipment mainly the radar my primary task is to find targets on the radar and maneuver the F3 verbally into a position where you're able to either engage them or go around the back to identify who they are you have to trust the pilot uh, totally with my life trust his ability and in Fred's case well I trust him, just.
Anti-submarine warfare from the air has become a highly sophisticated art. These are some of the early aircraft that engaged the unseen enemy. The Neptune, the Ventura, the Grumman Tracker. This is one of only two jet-powered anti-submarine warfare aeroplanes, the British Aerospace Nimrod MR2. The weapons bay in the fuselage can accommodate a full range of anti-submarine weaponry such as stingray torpedoes, mines and depth charges. The wingtip pods have electronic warfare support measures equipment. This flight of Orion's has flown in from Edinburgh in South Australia. The Orion is a long-range maritime patrol aircraft, able to stay in the air for over 17 hours. Its normal armament is a complement of torpedoes. In direct contrast is the Optica Scout, a two-seater light observation aircraft designed for custom services and police patrol work.
This is the Christian Eagle, designed as an economical transport, and the Skytech Maverick, built by Skytech of Western Australia. And if you're really adventurous, you can build this front and rear engine route and defiant from a kit in your own backyard. This is the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet, a multi-mission lightweight fighter attack aircraft. It forms the spearhead of the RAAF's fighter forces and has replaced the Mirage. It's designed to carry a variety of weaponry, an M61 multi-barrel, 20mm cannon, Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles. Psychology in, in training of a fighter pilot is, is a fairly important aspect of his training. Uh, right from the start pilot training, they, they teach you to be fairly aggressive and, uh, and work hard to get what you want. Uh, then more so in fighter training, they really work very aggressively to make you think aggressively and uh, positive. Uh, not much time for, for mistakes, so you have to be, have a good decision making and it's got to be a good decision. So they work on that and you need to be aggressive in your outlook to how you're going to fight. So. Uh, you know, for example, when you get into, a, into an environment against another aircraft, you see that aircraft, you can't really think about who's in that aeroplane or who's flying it. You've got to think about the capabilities of the aircraft and a uh, fairly cold way of looking at, at the, uh, the fight and the environment at the time, but that's the only way you can fight. If you went up thinking about someone's attitude and how they're going to fly, in the real case, you've got no idea, so you can't really do that. And that's how we try and train as well. It's just total concentration, really. Um, I don't think about the crowd or anything. I'm just thinking about the show, the next manoeuvre that I'm doing, the, the numbers that I need to meet to carry on with the next manoeuvre and so on. Uh, just the aeroplane and me, that's all I think about. I have to reach a certain height above the ground and a certain speed through the air before I can commit my nose down for a manoeuvre, so I'm concentrating on meeting those numbers. If you don't meet those numbers, then one or two things will happen. You either have to stop the manoeuvre there, or if you continue it, then something uh, not in the show might happen, you know, like you might have an accident or something like that. So you've got to be concentrating on those numbers to prevent any, uh, any problems or catastrophes.
not so much instinct, that's probably a bad word for it. Uh, what we rely on is skill and thought processes, you know, uh, recognising attitudes, air speeds and, uh, and so on. And when we go and work up a solo demonstration, we don't start low like you see it at the show. We start at a, at a higher altitude so that there's more room for error. And then as you become more current at it, then you just progressively get lower and lower and lower. We've got more power than the starting grid of the Formula One Grand Prix at Adelaide, for instance. We've got about 24,000 horsepower. And uh, that's all in one vehicle and one man. And so uh, it's, it's a buzz, it's, it's a thrill. It's good to get paid to do it, put it that way. The Pilatus Porter light utility aircraft was designed in Switzerland, specifically for operating to and from small rough strips. The Australian Army operates 19 of them. This is a plane right out of Australian folklore, the Nomad, designed and built in Australia. It is used by the military for battlefield liaison and by the Royal Australian Flying Doctor Service. The Pilatus PC-9 is a two-seater military training craft with a maximum speed of 556 kilometres per hour. 67 of them will be built at Bankstown in New South Wales for the RAAF.
The man who just performed that amazing manoeuvre is Chris Baru, Australia's champion aerobatic pilot. Chris has been Australian unlimited champion 13 times. The plane he's flying is a pit special. What more fitting finale could we have than an aerobatic display by Australia's leading team, the Roulettes? Experience counts for everything in a team like this. It's not uh, something that people with low experience can step into and uh, hope to perform successfully. It uh, really requires several thousand hours of flying experience before you uh, really got a chance of uh, putting it together. Any incident shakes the confidence of a team. The problem I was faced with when I came back to lead this team is to, to get the team together. A team is, uh, the team is everything about uh, what we do. Uh, we have to uh, know each other's abilities, uh, trust in each other, and uh, otherwise there is just no team. And uh, any incident uh, destroys that uh, team credibility, if you like, and uh, you have to work very hard to build that up. To be selected as a real edge, you have to be posted to RAF Base East Sale to Central Flying School for a start. Uh, that means you have been a flying instructor for some time, you've spent some time at one of our schools, and you would have uh, some experience on, on a Mackie. Uh, a thousand hours is now a minimum requirement we have uh, to be in the team, and uh, apart from that you have to be a volunteer, so we only take people who want to do the job. Performing at the Australian Boys Centennial Air Show means a great deal to us. It's something we've trained very hard for. We are representing the Royal Australian Air Force at this, uh, at this display. Uh, so we've, it really is uh, perhaps the ultimate show that the team will do.
Australian Bicentennial Air Show, we've seen the pride of the world's aviation industries and the cream of their pilots. We witnessed an aerial spectacular unprecedented in Australian history. It's unlikely that we'll see an air show of such size and scope here again. The Australian Bicentennial Golf Classic, distributed by CEL Home Video in a gift pack, including golf towel, tees, markers and a pitch mark repairer. Norman. Davis. Faldo. Woosman. Graham. Marsh. Fifty of the best golfers in the world. A classic field for a classic golf tournament. The Australian Bicentennial Golf Classic. On December the 1st, 1988, the Royal Melbourne Golf Course will host one of the richest golf tournaments in history. $1.5 million will be on offer to the competitors. More than three times the prize money offered by any other tournament and nearly equal to the entire prize money of the annual PGA Tour. An international team of commentators, assisted by 45 different camera positions, will cover every play. And, as you'd expect from the best golfers in the world, the play will be fantastic. Third, and what a lovely stroke. Oh. The Australian Bicentennial Golf Classic, one of the richest golf tournaments in history. CEL, Communications and Entertainment Limited.